Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Stonely Foundation, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar entitled Understanding Gun Violence Victimization and Perpetration Among School-Age Youth in Philadelphia. My name is Marie Williams, and I'm Deputy Director of the Stonely Foundation and moderator for this afternoon's event. For those of you who are not familiar with Stonely, we are a Philadelphia-based foundation that awards fellowships to exceptional leaders who work within, alongside, and outside of systems of care to improve the life outcomes of young people and families. At Stonely, like all of you, we've always been concerned about community violence. But in 2020, we doubled down by committing all of our Emerging Leader Fellowship investments to focus on reducing gun violence in our city. And we partnered with a new cadre of Stonely Fellows who we believe are part of the vanguard of leaders in policy, practice, and applied research about gun violence, including Dr. Ruth Abaya, Dr. Jessica Beard, and most recently, Dr. Brandy Blasco, all of whom are helping us to collectively understand and address gun violence in our city. As of April 1, 2024, there have been 181 non-fatal and 62 fatal shootings in Philadelphia. Though these numbers indicate a downward trend, we realize that this is no reason to celebrate, especially when, as in the last few weeks, the violence affects our young people and school-age children, either as victims and or perpetrators. I'm honored today to be joined by four experts and leaders in our city who are at the forefront of unearthing knowledge, designing policies, and implementing practices to keep students across Philadelphia safe. First, we have with us Philadelphia Police Commissioner Kevin Bethel. Commissioner Bethel previously served as the Chief of School Safety at the School District of Philadelphia, and before that as a Stonely Fellow where he led the development and implementation of the Philadelphia Police School Diversion Program. We also have with us Dr. Brandy Blasco, who I referenced earlier. Dr. Blasco is a current Stonely Fellow working with the Office of School Safety at the School District of Philadelphia to research the educational factors related to gun violence victimization and perpetration among current and former students. We have with us as well, Chief Craig Johnson, who is the Interim Chief of School Safety at the School District, where he oversees the implementation of district-wide school safety best practices. And last but not least, Dr. Tanya Walford. She's the Chief of District Evaluation, Research, and Accountability, and leads the district's use of data and evidence to improve outcomes for students. Welcome to all of you. So just before we begin, as a reminder to the audience, following this afternoon's presentation and discussion, we're going to have plenty of time for Q&A, but we invite you to please submit your questions throughout the event using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And please, when you do so, include your name and your organization so the speakers know who is asking the question. With that, let's get started with our conversation. So Commissioner Bethel, I'm gonna start with you first. Um, you were at the School District of Philadelphia as the school safety chief at the inception of Dr. Blasco's research about the involvement of school-age young people in gun violence perpetration or as victims. Can you tell us a little bit about the impetus for that research from your then perspective as school safety chief? And then after that, if you could um, talk about the continuing relevance of the research to you now as commissioner at the Philadelphia Police Department. All right, thank you uh, for that, Marie. Well, first, let me begin by thanking Stonely and uh, for the opportunity to be here to present uh, to the to the audience. It's, it's really important to get this information out. Um, so I'll, I'll start with the, the the first part of your question. You know, I've, from for many, I've, I've been in in the public safety space for almost thirty eight years now. Uh, and I've seen a lot over that time period. Um, and, and during that time period, I was very familiar with the homicide review uh, process from the public health department and, and others who were participant, the police department was a participant. And, and, and during that period of time, I also, uh, Dr. Rufa Baya, as part of her work and her fellowship was, had invited me to uh, 
uh, a review of the homicide review process again. And I remember uh, sitting in that space being kind of not frustrated, right? Because we were trying to go back in time and, and, and really it was difficult to go back in time unless you had all of the intersecting points of what was going on with that individual at, at that in that space. And, and, and so the, you know, I really would sit there oftentimes really frustrated because so much information was missing. Um, and, and, and so and as time went on, um, you know, I really started to think about it. It stayed in the back of my mind of something I wanted to do, something I thought about, some those questioning, those those wise things you ask, why is it happening? Uh, fast forward, uh, uh, you know, I had the opportunity to bring in Dr. Blasco, and uh, I always appreciate uh, Dr. Wolford's uh, support in that to come on because I would be research and based. I, you know, I took over the Office of School Safety in, in 2019. I really wanted to be uh, data informed and really uh, let the data drive as I was looking to reimagine the Office of School Safety, but really as, as the forefront of our work would be data informed, which that made Dr. Wolford very happy, as you would know. Um, and, and so part of that, so, so Dr. Blasco would come on and start this work, but then I, this, this just came to me around, would there be an opportunity uh, to really, really try to figure out if, if from a school district perspective, we could get this data to be able to look upstream in the school district, like where was the intersection point for us as a school district entity? Um, recognizing that somebody who at this point now be coming in the district, just seeing the downstream impacts of, of our young people and what was happening to them in the school setting. And, you know, part of my work, particularly even around the diversion work was, you know, trying to find the why, what happened to that child to got them to be in that place? Because clearly something had to happen. And, and so I was really fortunate uh, when we uh, would work with the, reach out to the Philip, the police department, and ask them, would they be aligned with us? And then at the time I wasn't here at the department uh, to say, would you provide us with the data to be able to take that backward look? Uh, going to Dr. Wolford and really asking her, I mean, I think this is a great idea for us, a great concept. And she really said, embrace it as, as, as the district's leader of the data for the district and all things research, but I'll, I'll talk about data now and, and saying yes. And, and, and so they provided us with over 2,000 you know, students who were school age students who were have been involved in shootings, been shot, uh, unfortunately uh, been a victim of a homicide, but also has committed homicides and committed shootings. And, and for the first time, it, for me, it, I thought it, it gave us an opportunity to take a to go back in time and see those intersections. Uh, of my vision was much more big. I mean, big vision around not the why just for us, but we represent the urban centers across the nation that if, if, if we're able to if do this effectively, the impact we can have on so many young people, particularly kids of color across our nation in urban centers, uh, could we have done something different? I'm very confident that Dr. Blast is gonna find it. I am very, very confident that that's going to do that. And so the opportunity to, to, to embark on this fellowship and to be able to really, really you know, do this work, I'm, I'm so appreciative because it was something, and when you're sitting there in the district, and as, as Chief Johnson will tell you, and every day, I think for your audience, uh, folks don't under, may not know, but every day there's an officer, one of our children, a school age child was shot. We give that information, the police department, now me here, provide that information over to school safety. They will identify what school that child goes to, and then they will notify Dr. Wallinson and the team and specifically those principals of those schools, as well as their trauma team, you know, and, and provide the supports for that child, that school, that family uh, uh, in, in that space. So, so every day we, we were seeing that and, and every day, you know, it raised those questions about, about that. As, as, so, so that's where I am. So you'll see me get excited about that because I, I just think uh, I'm just so grateful to have the, 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 you know, the team working in that work um, and looking forward to the outcomes. As you read how that evaluate how they're, uh, it's impacting us now and, 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 and what we're using that, what are some of the things that Dr. Blasco is very preliminary doing? I won't get into all the specifics of her data because I know she's going to present, but she was able to give us some, you know, look at the data, who, what, when, where, and why. And she was able to give us some data to be able to say, you know, if you go here and during these times and in these places, you can have an impact on the juvenile violence in, in the city, particularly as it relates to our school-aged children. 
And, and so, you know, taking that arm with that information, both with what schools they, the, the, the children go to and, and the zip codes and their other stuff, you know, we are able to now, you know, in our, in our work, uh, as I introduce my 100 day plan next, next week, uh, we'll use that data as to what where we're going to go as relates to you know our, our young people um, and more importantly using that data to inform other people other work you know whether it be my partners in the department of human services or other who work with children the work we're going to do you know around uh our curfews all of that activity really can take us and be laser focused because at the end of the day i don't have you know my staffing numbers are, are, are down uh, and so I need to find all of the partners and but be very strategic and be very data informed about where I would deploy my men and women to have the most effective strategy in dealing with the violence that they see. So so I think and that's just the first salvo of data that she's been able to provide. I'll be more excited about the additional elements that as, as those layers continue to come out of the research to be able to really, really change the way, not just the policing, but I think the city uh, overall. Uh, looks at, at young people uh, and where we should be really, really focusing our efforts. So, so I'm, I'm just glad to be able to share that uh, that prelude, prelude to you as to how we got to this place. And, and but again, eternally grateful to Stonely uh, and the team at, 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 at the school district uh, to be continuing to pushing this forward. Even though I moved on, I'm a great partner over here. So the beauty of it all is now that I'm at the school district, they don't have to want for any data. I, I am waiting in, with, with uh, bated breath for everything that comes from this. Great, thank you for that. So I, I think what I'm hearing is that um, the research is equally relevant to you in your current space as it was when you were school safety chief. Yeah, I think we're even more so than now. I mean, we, yeah. you know, I'm a data, it's about data and, and really informing, you know, yes, absolutely, uh, uh, two times over, you know, uh, and, and they, we are a core partner in, in making this research go well because I think all of us, you know, department benefits, but I think the city and our children, our young people will benefit uh, the most out of all of this. Absolutely. Um, so Dr. Blasco, we have been talking about your research and now we're gonna give you an opportunity to share with us um, some of your preliminary findings about um, you know, what's happening with our school age youth as either victims or perpetrators of gun violence. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Marie. Thank you. So the title, the title of my research presentation today is linking educational predictors to gun violence victimization among school age youth. So today I'll present some background um, about my project, data sources for my Stone Lee Fellowship, um, findings from the first part of my three-part project, and conclude with some takeaway points. So as I'm sure many of you know, firearm injuries, including suicide, homicide, and accidental injury, have emerged as the leading cause of death for youth in the United States. In the city of Philadelphia, on average, 1,800 people are shot each year, and about one-third of those are school-age youth. So given these statistics, my fellowship is a multi-stage study of student gun violence. The two main objectives for this project are to first, identify the primary educational drivers of gun violence victimization and perpetration among school district of Philadelphia students. So while work to date has examined individual and community level predictors of um, youth gun violence, there's little understanding about how individual level education variables specifically can serve as either protective or risk factors. A recent, recent scoping review of risk and protective related factors related to youth firearm violence also revealed that no studies have focused on school level factors specifically as they relate to gun violence victimization among youth. The second objective focuses on prevention and intervention, specifically by identifying high risk times and locations for student gun violence victimization. Today, I will present the latter part of this project, specifically identifying high risk times and locations for gun violence victimization among public school students in Philadelphia. Our panel discussion today will also show how we, are all, how we are already using these findings to inform practice. So 
data for this project come from both the Philadelphia Police Department and School District of Philadelphia. The Office of School Safety maintains Philadelphia Police Department data on all youth shooting victims in the city of Philadelphia. These data are then matched to school records main, maintained by the school district. The data I'll present today are three um, school years, so 2021 to 20, 2020 to 2021, 21 to 22, and 22 to 23. In the slides, youth include all individuals up to the age of 22 years in the city of Philadelphia, and this is based upon um, PA, Department of Education regulations related to school enrollment ages. So from the start of the 20 to 21 school year through the end of the 22 to 23 school year, 2000 youth, so remember that's like 22 and under, were victims of gun violence in the city of Philadelphia. So this shows a breakdown of youth by school enrollment status. So of those 2000 youth shot in Philadelphia during those three school years, the majority were either active or former students of the school district of Philadelphia. A smaller portion were never students in the school district, but the data show that a majority who were never students had home addresses outside of Philadelphia. So this provides the last enrollment sec um, record by sector for each person at the time of the incident. So the sectors on the left and on the top, data are broken down by raw numbers and percent of the total for that category. During the three school years, 1,819 of the 2,000 shooting victims were current or former students. Almost half of these victims were students who were either active or last enrolled in K through 12 schools followed by alternative schools and then charter schools. If we exclude former students from this number, over the last three years, 891 of the shooting victims were active students at the time of the incident. And again, nearly half of these were K through 12 students, whereas the other half involved alternative education and charter school students. As enrollment varies by sector, next, I show the data by rate per 1,000 students. So roughly one per 1,000 district students, so these are those K through 12 schools, were victims of gun violence over the last three school years, whereas 25 per 1,000 alternative education students were victims of gun violence. Looking deeper, these data are broken out by type of alternative education, including Penny Pack House, which is the SDP school within the Philadelphia Department of Prisons, the Philadelphia, well, bleh, the Philadelphia Juvenile Justice Service Center, and then alternative schools. So Penny Pack House and the Juvenile Justice Center are listed as the last school for active students, not because they were shot within those schools because they're incarcerated, but because they were shot be upon release before they were enrolled in another school um, in the community. As shown on the table, the rate per 1,000 is significantly higher for students released from Penny Pack House and the JJC as compared to alternative school placement. So for example, one in 1,000 district students are victims of gun violence, where um, compared to 122 per 1,000 students released from the JCC. The last group of slides provides high-risk times and locations for student gun violence. The findings I present today are the average over those three school years, but the findings are the same when replicated by school year. The data from the past three years show the most student shooting victimizations occurred in May. This is the number of active student gun violence victims by month. The blue portion of the bar represents victimizations that occurred when students were actively in session in school or in, in, in active school. The green portion of the bar represents shooting victimization that occurred while students were on summer break. Considering day of the week, the most student shooting victimizations occurred on a Monday. So this slide shows the number of students shot by day of the week. So I wanna note here that when I looked at the day of the week for all youth shooting, so that's any person under the age of 22 who, um, whether they were a student or not, the, mo the shootings most frequently occurred on weekends, which is consistent with what we know from um, criminological research. However, when I narrowed it down to just our active students only, Monday emerged as the high risk time. Next time of victimization, 
The mean time of day for shooting victimization among active students is around 4.30. So data show regardless of the day of the week, the majority of shootings occurred between 3 and 5 p.m. or those two hours following dismissal from school. And then finally, location. Findings show that over the past three school years, there were 2.5 students shot each month in the 19121 zip code on average. So this map displays the zip codes in Philadelphia where active students were shot. So the, this isn't where they live, but rather where the incident occurred, um, which is often different from where they live compared to their zip codes. So the darkest red color is, is the highest number, and these are 19121 and 19140 with more than 120 shootings per zip code. As the colors get lighter, the count goes down. So taken together, more than 50% of students are shot in five zip codes, 19121, 140, 134, 139, and 132. And it should also be noted that the location where students are shot is closer to their schools as compared to their homes. Thank you. Thank you for that, Brandy. I, I had a million questions other than the ones I told you I would ask, <laughs> but I'm going to try to refrain from asking those million questions. I want to focus in on your um, dates and days and times data. Um, if you want, you can put that slide back up so folks can see it. So there were a couple of things that jumped out for me that I think may have jumped out for other folks as well that I think the common wisdom or maybe not wisdom or belief is that kids are most school age kids are most at risk during the summer for these, you know, um, events, shooting events. And another would be that they're at risk during weekends. And I know researchers don't like to do this, but I wonder if there's anything that you extrapolate from the data that explains um, Monday, 4.30 p.m., why it, it seemed like a pretty um, significant escalation in risk for violence um, around these days and times. Do you have any thoughts on that or is there anything that you're seeing in um, your qualitative research that might explain this? Yeah, so what I think the important thing to take away from this is that um, I think a lot of times we use adult risk factors to when we are trying to look at protective risk factors related to youth. So one, recognizing that adult and youth are different. And then also recognizing that our school kids, the kids who are actively going to school, are going to be different than maybe individuals of the same age who are not attending school um, or maybe up to the age of 22. So I think that um, shows that since we don't have a lot of research on that, that this is really important. Great. Um, so the distinction for school age kids who are active in school, um, Monday, 430, it seems it'll seem arbitrary to those of us who don't know anything about this. Um, again, I'm going to push you a little bit. I know you hate to do it. <laughs> you're a researcher, you're a facts and figures person. But what's going on at Monday on Mondays at 430 with kids? Or Monday yeah, so like between three and five, because I think those were the hours that you specified. Right. So, um, so I think some uh, one potential implication is that um, students may get into arguments over the weekend, um, right? And then when they come to school on Monday, um, they can settle those arguments because they know where those individuals are, right? So they know that person's getting out of school at this time, um, and this is where we can kind of settle any issues that are happening, and we know we can find them here. Got it. Okay. I know that was painful, Brandy, for me <laughs> to take that out of you. But um, but but I would rather you as as like an informed participant in the research, like extrapolate than um, have us do it, right? Because we know so much less than you do. Um, so, Dr. Wolford, I'm going to turn to you. Um, in, in your capacity as chief of district evaluation research and accountability, talk to us a little bit about why this research matters and how it fits into the district's broader mission and its um, strategic priorities. Sure. And, it, and also, how can you leverage the research? Because I know, you know, that's absolutely a goal of your office and that of other offices at the school district. So how do you leverage research like this to support students and and minimize adverse outcomes like like shootings? 
Yeah, so I think the research in and of itself is incredibly valuable, having the specificity in terms of space and time. But I want to just step back and talk a little bit about the exemplary approach to leveraging data in research that's not trivial. So in this case, we have a pressing problem related to gun violence. And I remember before Brandy came on and just conversations around the district, people were speculating, right? Like, oh, it's all the kids from X school or it's people from this certain neighborhood. And people were responding to that. And um, under um, then chief, now commissioner Bethel's leadership, it was like, no, wait a minute, let's really get a handle on what's happening. So that is incredibly valuable to take a very complex, emotional pressing issue, but be able to be able to stop and say, we need to look at some data. We need to look at this in a more systematic way. So it's really starting with the who, what, where, uh, and why is, 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 just excellent and exemplary for how we try to support approaching problems within the district. I think another component of this is the external support. So really being able to bring in an expert um, from outside who can dedicate their time to working on this. Um, you know, we have a research office here. We don't have experts necessarily in this field and we're very focused on student outcome data, for instance. So being able to carve carve this out and, and really focus in on this issue is very important. Um, I'll also say, I really do think a highlight of this is the geospatial component and the zip code component, because what you'll notice from this, um, right, right now connected to violence or adverse outcomes for students, we have some very general topics, attendance, disciplinary action, not doing well in school, for instance. But this is really honing in to identify areas where resources can be directed and where hopefully um, you know, interventions can be leveraged to change the situation. And that's not always the case, right? We often approach things, we wanna do something for everybody, or if we have to do something in one place, then in order to be fair, we have to provide it in other places. And this is essentially the opposite of that in terms of being able to identify um, places to intervene. Did I get all your questions? <laughs> I think I think you did. Um, and, uh, so, and I also appreciate that you uh, mentioned that there are other adverse outcomes for young people other than school shootings. And um, certainly you're attentive to those as well. Um, so, Chief Johnson, I'm going to turn to you because you are the man sitting in the um, potentially hot seat at the Office of School Safety. Um, so what, what are some of the practical implications and applications of this research? And are there initiatives in the district that you're implementing to protect students um, from the threat of gun violence? And, and how does this research help to inform you know, your future planning beyond the initiatives that you currently have. Well, good afternoon, Marie, and thank you very much for those questions. And thank you to the Stonely Foundation for having me here today. Welcome. Dr. Blasco's research is vital to prevention effort, efforts. So much of our work is responsive. We constantly respond to incidents, rumors, threats, social media, et cetera. The ability to utilize the data as an early intervention tool is moving in the, in the right direction and allows the district, the police department, and other partners to deploy resources accordingly. This data could certainly be considered when establishing new safe paths, safe corridors, Philadelphia police school safety zones, enhanced patrol areas, and city camera placements. Um, as Dr. Blasco Shared, we track shooting incidents involving youth in the city of Philadelphia. And as was shared uh, by my colleagues, although the number of victims is down significantly when compared to the same time frame from last school year, there are still far, far too many. We must remember the victims of gun violence reach much further than just those who were shot. <clears throat> those who, each person who was a witness, a relative, a friend of someone who was shot, is also a victim of gun violence, and these numbers are immeasurable. When we speak with groups of our youth and ask how many know someone who is a victim of gun violence, the number of hands that goes up is absolutely astounding. The Office of School Safety is consistently looking for innovative ways and emerging technology to enhance safety. 
We look at the overall safety from a layered of approach or safety net inclusive of prevention, presence, and response. We promote the use of, use of prevention resources, including uh, safety net, which is a school district email address in which district employees, partners, and general public can email safety feedback, suggestions, or concerns. The information is received directly by school safety leadership who can coordinate appropriate follow-up to each submission. We also promote the use of Safe to Say Something, which is a youth violence prevention program run by the Pennsylvania State Attorney General's Office. This program teaches youth and adults to recognize warning signs, especially within social media, and to say something before it's too late. Tips can be reported anonymously via a free app or a toll-free number, and notifications are made to both the Philadelphia Police and the school district, which initiates the investigative process. Uh, we recently, as a result of the tragic incident uh, involving the Northeast students, were made aware of a uh, SEPTA Transit Watch, which is another free app which enables people to report anything that makes them feel less safe on the SEPTA system. Those reports are re received by SEPTA police dispatchers who can direct nearby patrols to vet any concerns. Some of the prevention initiatives underway by the school district and the Office of School Safety include weapon screening. Uh, we utilize weapons detection equipment to deter and, and prevent the introduction of weapons in our buildings. All high schools are equipped with airport style x-ray machines and walk through magnetometers to screen students and visitors. The school district experienced a significant increase in firearm incidents in lower grade schools after students returned from COVID to in-person learning. We implemented a pilot program of minimally invasive weapon screening technology in our middle schools, specifically targeted towards preventing firearms from entering our buildings. So Office of School Safety is also fortunate enough to have collaborated with the Philadelphia Police Athletic League, and we have um, instituted three uh, school safety PAL centers in our middle schools. Each of these PAL centers are run by school safety officers and receive uh, support from the Philadelphia Police Department PAL program. The centers are open daily after school until 7 p.m. and include homework help, arts and crafts, sports, and video games. Safe Path program is another initiative at reducing violence. It's based on the Chicago Public School Safe Passage program. In August of 2022, the Office of School Safety contracted with a community-based partner to implement the Safe Path program, which provides trusted adults in the corridors. Uh, we started with six schools as students travel home in the afternoon. Since its inception, the, the program has certainly been uh, a positive, and we have expanded to engage six separate community-based partners and now service 25 schools. Office of School Safety also utilizes a, a transitional mentoring program in five of our high-needs high schools in which uh, we have an officer who's designated to provide a daily touch point and check-in for support to students who are returning to school from placement. Another very important initiative that we piloted over the past year is the Youth Violence Reduction Initiative, YVRI. And it's a pilot program taken from the Cure Violence model, aimed to interrupt the cycle of violence by utilizing caring, trained adults to engage and build strong, trusting relationships with students likely to be involved in gun violence. This program launched last school year at Bartram High School and has served 63 students to date. Serious incidents have, at the school have trended downward in most categories since program implementation, and we are looking to expand that program to Overbrook High School. The district is currently in the process of upgrading our CCTV infrastructure citywide. The CCTV upgrade project will implement a citywide enterprise level genotech video management system for all current digital systems, upgrade and integrate all older analog systems to new digital systems connected to the genotech platform. Our, our CCTV system design has been shifted from cameras capturing limited areas of the school to full campus coverage of all common areas, both interior and exterior. Data is utilized. Um, it's, it's a data-driven prioritization model, which takes into account the crime index, the reported serious incidents, student enrollment, building footprint, and the type of school, high school, middle school, elementary school. Um, further in the prevention area, our area managers hold bi-weekly regional safety team meets where they, where they meet with school leaders, public and charter, law enforcement, local civic leaders, and community groups to provide a, a forum for information sharing and problem solving of issues in their respective areas of the city. Uh, one initiative that uh, then Chief Bethel, now Commissioner Bethel, was working on was, was a heat map in which 
basically we were looking to outline um, out to lay out on a map the incidents of crime in and around our school so that we could possibly develop uh, information on the best routes for school for students to take when they're traveling to and from school in the afternoon hours. We also work with a number of partners who help us because we can't do it all by ourselves. And so some of the partners that we use for prevention and response, Town Watch Integrated Service, the Philadelphia Anti-Drug, Anti-Violence Network, and the Philadelphia Commission on Human Relations are all uh, agencies that we turn to to assist us when we need some help reaching out to individuals in the community to try to prevent violent incidents from occurring. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that's a lot. That's a lot. I, no one's going to accuse you of not having given us a comprehensive answer to that question. So thank you. Thank you very much for that, Chief Johnson. Did you have more? I, there I was saw, more, but it's okay. I saw you take a breath. We're doing a lot of things. Yeah. I, listen, I, I will say uh, uh, it was just a pleasure to work under Commissioner Bethel. He brought in a, a real breath of fresh air to this department. And like he said, uh, everything was data driven. We really operated a lot on anecdotal and what we thought, but he really introduced data and it's just become an integral part of what we do on a day to day basis. Well, and, and thank you for that. And I'm sure he thanks you as well. Um, I'm going to give you an opportunity later on um, as we uh, commence through the, the program to talk about how folks can get involved because there were so many programs that you mentioned um, that, you know, could probably benefit from community partnership or simply community knowledge that they're happening. Mm -hmm. Because I'm sure, you know, once there's been a shooting incident, the cry that you hear across the city is what is the school district doing? And it sounds like we're doing an extraordinary amount. And I think folks could benefit from learning yeah. how to become involved. And, and so lastly, I'll share it. I know there's a lot of information, but while there's no singular action which provides a solution to addressing and reducing gun violence, each action taken in each piece of the puzzle works cumulatively towards a reduction in victimization. Absolutely. So um, I'm going to turn back to you, Dr. Blasco and Dr. Wolford. Um, first, you, uh, Brandy, there was something you said before you uh, presented your research, um, and I want to make sure I had this right. So I think you said that there are no studies to date um, that have focused on um, educational protective and risk factors related to gun violence involving uh, school age youth. Is that, is that what I heard you say, is that correct? Yes, yeah, so um, so my, and I think this kind of maybe gets at one of the questions that's asked. So my study is actually taking, is a multi-level model. So it's gonna take into account individual level factors, school level factors and community factors all nested within each other. Um, and so looking at that from a multi-level model standpoint, there have been studies looking at some individual predictors as they directly relate to gun violence. Um, which the two factors that emerged in this, a recent scoping review is truancy and academic achievement. Um, but there has, and they say this directly in the scoping review that was um, published last year or in 2022, there are no, no one has yet looked at school level. So not individual, but that aggregate school level predictors of um, gun violence victimization or perpetration yet. So, so this research has the potential to have national implications as well. Yes. Great, that's good to hear. So Dr. Wolford, um, I'm gonna turn to you for this part of the question. So um, I, I think we'd all agree that a shooting incident involving a student is obviously um, a worst case scenario, but, um, and, and it runs the risk of um, eclipsing other adverse outcomes that we should be attentive to as we examine the data data that I'm sure in the regular course of business you collect, but data that might be augmented by Dr. Blasco's research. So um, what are some of the education-related leading indicators that we should be looking at and responding to um, that could potentially help us avoid not only shooting in incidents, but other adverse outcomes for young people? Yep, thank you for that. Um, yeah, there are two that we are focused heavily on. And if uh, for folks who watch our board meetings, you'll see that our superintendent, Dr. Watlington, presents on student attendance every month, as well as student dropouts. And so these things do end up 
ultimately being related, but again, they don't only lead to gun violence, but they certainly lead to adverse outcomes for students. So there are decades of uh, experience, uh, decades of research showing, um, as Brandy mentioned, academic performance is a very strong predictor. So that will be failing courses. We have a very robust monitoring um, uh, measure or indicator in our ninth grade on track work. That was developed in collaboration with um, the Chicago Two and Through Project, the Neubauer Family Foundation, and it was based on years of research out of Chicago public schools. So that's looking at ninth graders um, to ensure that they're enrolled in the core courses that they should be enrolled in and that they're actually passing those core courses. So either with A's, B's, A's, B's, or C's, or D's, but certainly not F's. So that's a strong predictor. And we we actually look at more than just ninth grade, but it's the ninth grade on track predictor that's very important. Um, uh, and then a second one is the chronic absenteeism. So uh, looking for students with greater than 10% um, uh, absences in, instructional days in a school year, um, those students have greater adverse outcomes. And this that intersects with academic performance. It intersects with potential disciplinary issues as well. And they're normally fairly complex underlying issues that connect with these things. So in the district, for instance, with attendance, we can see um, a um, incremental increases <laughs> in students who are not on grade level in kindergarten, you know, as absences increase. So students with zero um, absences in kindergarten, roughly 70% of them will be at grade level at the end of kindergarten. But if we go down to students with, I think it's 30, 40 absences in kindergarten, only four out of 10 of those kids will be on grade level at the end of kindergarten. We can jump forward. We see the same trend when we look at ninth graders' attendance relative to their graduation rate. So ninth graders missing zero to four days. This is in ninth grade. 90% of them will graduate within four years. Jump down to um, ninth graders missing 30 to 40 days. Of um, Only 40% of them will graduate on time. Right. And the and the graduate the correlation between graduation or lack of lack thereof and even worse adverse outcomes is still being established or has it been established in the research? Yeah, not completing high schools associated with poor economic outcomes, health, poor health outcomes throughout life, and it's associated with later incarceration in life. So uh, you know, we're describing through Brandy's research, she's describing sort of, um, again, an adverse outcome end of these factors, but many of these early warning indicators, and they build upon each other to get to those adverse outcomes. Got it. So, um, Chief Johnson, I'm going to turn back to you for a moment. You alluded to this in your remarks, but, um, you know, t tell us a little bit more about the aftermath of a school shooting incident. Um, what what do you experience from your seat after that? What does it do to the climate in the schools, um, not only for those who are directly involved? And then what are some of the effects that you see on students and families in the wider community? Right. And so I will say, uh, you know, the, the effects of a, a significant tragic in incident, uh, such as what occurred in early March, requires a, a very intentional response which leverages close coordination of school leadership and multiple internal and external partners and agencies. Um, it, it will absolutely invoke fear amongst the students and not just amongst the students, but the staff members as well. The supports needed to return to school in this community to a sense of normalcy is a long-term undertaking. It, it's not immediately, it's not one day, two days, three days, it's, it's over a course of time. Uh, externally, close coordination with our school safety, Commissioner Beth on the police department, uh, Chief Lawson and SEPTA PD, Town Watch Integrated Services, all, all with a bolstered uh, sense of presence, both in the area of the school and within the school and in those corridors where the children and, and the staff members travel, all are, are a critical aspect of allaying the fears associated uh, with being outside of the building and traveling on public transportation. 
Caring for the mental, mental and physical well-being of the students and staff is also a top priority, and district leaders have to work closely with our district's emergency crisis response team from the Office of Prevention and Intervention to provide students to both supports as uh, provide supports to both students and staff members, such as grief counseling and emotional assistance. So there's like extensive human and other costs when there's a school shooting well beyond the day that the incident occurred. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so given that commissioner Bethel, I'm going to turn to you, um, hearing all of what, uh, chief Johnson described. And, um, for those of us who just hear about this in the news, um, it, it creates a narrative like a growing public narrative that um, students are no longer safe. Um, how, how would you respond to caregivers, teachers, and young people um, who have this concern that going to and coming from school and school in general is just not as safe an undertaking as it should be? Um, so, so first of all, sir, let me, if I could piggyback on what uh, Chief Johnson says, I mean, it, it is, I don't think people understand sometimes, I think they do, but it's a significant level of ripple effect when we have violence, particularly around our schools and the impact it has on our students and our staff and, and our staff, you know, uh, and, you know, I think, you know, it's, 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 it's really, really difficult. Uh, and then when you, you know, I, after the recent shootings that we had uh, the week of March 4th, on that Monday, you know, five individuals shot, three of them students, one getting killed. Uh, and then coming back two days, three days later, it really sets a ripple uh, through uh, uh, yeah, the, the schools. Uh, I went to MOTEP with the mayor, had, had uh, you know, put together a meeting and we went to talk to Damon Taylor's mother, uh, who, you know, at MOTEP and you know, it, it's difficult to, to see, you know, the impact you know, and what that ripple effect. And then in Northeast High School, we met with another parent and and one of the children who was shot and sitting in the, in the, you know, in the office and listening to the fear, you know, mom talking about, you know, taking my son to and from and scared, you know, he would not have been out there that day. She normally picks him up, you know, and that's why I told, you know, your, your the folks who are attending it was so important for us to bring, you know, this, these individuals in because that set off this thing across the city parents are saying, well, there's people riding around shooting kids on the, on the, on the bus stop. And you think about that, you know, we, you know, we have thousands and thousands of kids are moving to the system. So that's why we continue to work hard, even in solving the case on Ogons Avenue. That all being said, that's the culmination. That's what starts this process of fear. Um, and so I, I'll talk out of both sides of my mouth now. Despite all of that, even despite the tragic incident we had, you know, in the early part of March, um, the schools are the safest place for our children to be, right? Inside the school, inside, when I talk about the school, being at school, you know, engaged in the school for all those things, the downstream things that Dr. Wolf and Dr. Vasco talk about, but most importantly about safety. So let's just put it in context. That, so sometimes uh, over the last three years, 2021 would be the most, one of the most difficult times in, in, in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, with 562 homicides and, you know, 2,300 shooting victims. I mean, it, just, it was just one of the, the highest volumes of violence we've ever seen. And so that, and you come in and coming back after 2021 and then 2022, 514 homicides, another 2,200 shootings. And then, you know, last year, 410. And then, you know, 1,600 shootings. Let's total that up. Out of all the shootings, we had 60, almost 6,200 shooting victims over the last three years and close to 1,500 homicide victims. Whew. That's a lot. And, and, and particularly in those zip codes where many of our margin and many of our marginalized communities and you know where 10 of our areas of the city encompass almost 80% of our violence. And, and so when you look at the number, so even during the tragic shootings that we had in March and, and, and you look across those same time period, those number of kids, and even we had some, very, as you know, some very tragic situations, you know, homicides out of our, in front of our schools in Roxborough, directly in front of the schools, and, and, and two others, Barton, uh, Lincoln, and go through the schools. But those are, when you look at them by the numbers per se, a very, very small percentage, very like a fraction 
of that larger group that I just described to you. And so sometimes I think we have to take the full capacity of all the numbers and say, wow, that's a lot. And, and so clearly, you know, having our kids in school away from all of that is going on, having our young people in out of school time, you know, we can see from the data that Dr. Blasco presented that's the right thing to do, right? We are right in that space of saying, keeping your kids after school, keeping them engaged for the next two and two and a half hours after school is absolutely the right thing to do. We don't, we can use this data now that to inform that. And so, so I think we have to continue to make sure that the narrative don't, you know, don't allow that, you know, these incidences, which are tragic and, and, and for the families and traumatic to the schools, but that is the place where we can best serve our kids. As a kid who grew up in the city, who went to John Bartram High School, you know, John Bartram was the safest place for me to be. Is where I didn't want to have any food. That's where I ate. When I needed fellowship, that's where I got fellowship. And you know, and and so I told folks, you know, our, if our kids, we need services for our kids. If we need supports for our kids. There's no better place to wrap it around them in a school setting, because you can do all of that there, right? And so, so I, I just think, uh, you know, for me, um, to even now this year alone, we've had 68 homicides. And six of those involve children under the age of 18. So that's 8.82%. And we're down 40% uh, in, in our shootings uh, in that area of juvenile, you know. And, and so the ripple effect of that is that the school district is not dealing with some of the traumatic violence they were sending. They're still seeing it. And this is, you know, this is for a year to date for us and their school year runs differently. Uh, and so I, I just want to make sure that we always have that narrative in the back of mind. We're going to work hard to keep those schools safe. I know cameras are being installed, other things. We're going to do our safe path programs. But despite all the things that we see and some of the things that were happening away from the school, and even with the data that Dr. Blasco, it is still the safest place to be. Thank you. Um, we're going to turn to audience Q&A in a moment, but I want to give you all an opportunity to um, to put out an ask. Um, what often happens when there are shootings of any kind, but certainly those involving school age young people, is we extend empathy, sympathy, and we feel a little bit of relief that we don't have the tough job that some of you have. But in fact, there's a lot that we as community members might do. So the last question I'll pose to any and all of you who might want to answer, what, what do you need from the community, from uh, government leaders, from funders? Um, what are the ways that we can um, join you all in uh, continuing to combat gun violence in our city, but specifically to keep uh, Philadelphia students safe? And um, anyone who wants to go first, please do. And if you don't, I will call on you. I'll just jump in because I did just want to add a little bit around um, some of the reasons for absenteeism in school right. and how important attendance is. Um, they extend beyond factors at school. So there are certainly factors where students just refuse to attend because they're not engaged. They don't have high quality instruction, access to that, or there's mistrust of the system. There may be disconnect with their learning. So not knowing, you know, I don't need this math class because I'm going to do something else in my life. Um, or, you know, then something that is um, also a chronic potential chronic problem is lack of teachers that reflect them culturally, factors like that. But beyond that, there are also reasons that students simply cannot attend. And those are most more social factors, right? So poverty and lack of resources, transportation, chronic physical or mental or other health issues, uh, family responsibilities, taking care of siblings, um, fear of riding on public transportation. So there's a lot of issues that push out more into the community that are factors where, you know, if we're thinking about um, supporting children, where many others can do things to support children to um, to address some of those issues about not being able to attend school. Thank you for that. And, and I think it, it, it's not a digression from the question in some ways. It's very responsive. Um, I, I'm not sure how much communication um, schools often get about those other factors that uh, cause absenteeism. And I'm sure that that is something that families and community, communities can do. 
in terms of combating this issue. Um, does anyone else want to chime in on that? Commissioner Bethel, I see that you yeah. have your- No, I, I just, you know, for me, Maria, I, I just think sometimes we also, I, I know a lot of your, your folks are attending or, or working in this juvenile space. And I think sometimes we have to look at the glass half full and also say that the work they are doing is impactful. I mean, as I share with, you know, 10% or ten percent of all of our juvenile, of all the violence we see across the city are juveniles, right? 10%. And it's been like that for almost a decade. We've popped up and we've gone up a little bit in certain specific areas that, you know, 13, 11, 12%, but really have stayed in that median for quite some time. And so clearly we know schools matter. Clearly we know that the work uh, those the folks are doing out in the field, sometimes it doesn't get their due recognition it deserves. But it's clear that we do something with our juveniles to keep them in that that space. Now we want to go down, but it has not gone up, right? And, and so, so I think that's important. The average age of our, our homicide victim and shooting victim, I believe, is 26, 27 years old now. And, and so, so I think, uh, and I think, I see two hundred forty-one participants on your on your screen in my in my box here. What we do know is that having a positive adult in one of these children's lives can change totally change the trajectory of where they're going. And so I think anybody who's on this call, in addition to the programmatic things and the money, et cetera, but all of us should be touching someone, you know, in some way, in an informed and consistent way, so that we can help them in that change. And we do know that the data tells us that, you know, if they have a positive adult in their lives, we can really change the direction they go. That happened for me. I didn't know it was happening at the time, but recognize it as I got into my older years. And, and so I think that's critical to the work. Thank you. Anyone else want to chime in, Chief Johnson? Yeah, so I, I absolutely want to say what, what Commissioner Bethel, Bethel shared absolutely resonates. I think there's nothing more important in in our young folks' lives than to him having a connection with a trusted, caring adult. I will say that in this business over 28 and a half years, so many, so much of the information that comes to us that allows us to intervene uh, before something tragic happens comes as a result of a young person having a trusted uh, relationship with some adult that they feel comfortable talking to and giving them information that they have. Um, we need to know what's going on with our young folks. A lot of them are struggling. You know, I um, was born and raised right here in the city of Philadelphia, and I've seen my share, but I will say coming up, I, I didn't have that many of the people that were connected to me that were the victims of gun violence. And so we really just have to stay connected to our young folks, volunteer, mentor, all of those things just really, really matter. Thank you. And I, I know you mentioned, Chief Johnson, when you gave us... Um, your list of programs and initiatives, that there are some among those that require community participation, community engagement. Um, I'm not gonna put you on the spot to list those now, but just to um, it, let folks know that after this event, we will certainly um, you know, uh, disseminate some of that information for folks. Um, I know Brandy's not gonna ask for it, so I'm gonna do it on her behalf. I think everyone knows that there's a dearth of funding a dearth of research around what gun violence. <laughs> go, go ahead, Brandy, you'll do it better than I will. So why don't I give you the space to do that? Um, I was just going to say that, and don't quote, I don't remember the exact percentage, but um, I was recently at the National Research Conference for the Prevention of Firearm Related Harms. And it was striking to me when I believe someone presented the breakdown of um, funding, federal funding also um, contributed to firearm and gun um, violence research. Um, and so um, I think advocating for um, federal dollars for that research is important. And and private philanthropic dollars, yeah. right? Yes, so, exactly. Um, definitely there's a role for every type of funder to play. Um, I see Mark Hauk on the screen, and that is my cue that we are going to move into audience Q&A. Mark's going to be facilitating that for us, but... Um, uh, all of our panelists will remain to answer your questions. Mark. Thank you, Marie. And so just so all of our audience members know, feel free to still submit your questions to the audience Q&A. We have lots of questions queued up already. We're gonna to try to get to as many of those as possible, but if you submit a question, we don't have a chance to get to it. We'll make sure that our speakers today do get a copy of those questions. So with that, I'm just gonna dive right into it and apologies in advance for any names. So first question comes from Heather Culp, so nurse practitioner at CHOP. Um, and trauma and season treats many victims of gun violence. For students involved in shootings, what are the options for returning to schools? For example, many parents don't wanna to return to school. Kids are worried as well. I believe that many can go virtually or offer to transfer to new schools. 
but what follow-up services through the school district are available in terms of transportation or otherwise? Does anyone want to take a gander at that? I knew we we did want, and out of a concern for the size of the panel and the time that we had, um, we did want to have folks from the Office of School Support Services. I hope I'm getting that, that name right. Student Support Services. Student mm -hmm. Support Services. Um, does anyone want to give us a, or, or even um, contact information for how folks might learn more about the support services that are available? Dr. Wolford, are you the appropriate person to say who they should reach out to or just knowing the name of the office is sufficient? Yeah, it's the Office of Student Support Services. Um, it's under Chief Karen Lynch. Um, who, and I did think there were going to be some folks in the audience to answer, but I'm not seeing them. So yes, that, that would be the officer. We can take it and follow up. And there is a sort of a prophylactic approach around transportation, right? Um, Chief Johnson, um, is it the Safe Passage program? Am I saying that right? So a safe pass is not really, a, it's, it's for students who are walking to and from school. Um, we do have a 24-7 patrol uh, uh, program in which we have officers who are mobile around the city uh, and they kind of, they patrol the students, the areas where students, when they're traveling to and from school. Um, we don't, we're not able to blanket the entire city, but we do work closely with the Philadelphia Police Department as well as the police. And we do try to concentrate on those high traffic areas or those high traffic transportation hubs where large groups of students gather. And is, is the same true, Commissioner Bethel, in terms of uh, transportation corridors for young people where um, they might have been identified as high risk? Does PPD have any initiatives around that? Yeah, we, we, we will be shortly announcing some, some increased activity along those core, car, core, uh, those core corridors, but we also are very careful understanding, I believe the city is about 134 square miles. Uh, yeah. So the sheer you know, level of uh, roadway we have in the city makes that extremely challenging. And so I think uh, Chief Johnson was uh, spot on. We, we try to focus at, at the, uh, the major hubs. I um, met recently with SEPTA to talk about some of the areas where we could uh, be doing uh, some work along the corridors, uh, but, you know, just also by managing the expectations that that's, there's, that's a lot of traveling and, and a lot of territory to cross. Uh, and so using the data to try to be more laser focused on where uh, is important. Okay. Thank you. Mark. Perfect. Thank you all. So the next question comes from Philip Harris. This one's probably for Dr. Blasco. Um, do you know if there is a relationship between zip code frequencies of youth gun shootings in locations of adult gun shootings? And if so, do you happen to know why? Hmm. Sorry, so that was, um, are the zip code, high-risk zip codes different for youth and adults? Or if they're, if they're similar or if they're different, and if so, do you happen to know why either way? Um, Commissioner Bethel might know the overall zip codes for in general um, and whether they compare to the school district ones. I, I, what I would share, and I'm not sure if I'm going to answer this properly, but one of the things we can do is looking at those zip codes that that uh, Dr. Blasco identified in the data. Uh, so I think there is maybe a question in queue by 19121, which is North Philadelphia. Uh, and so, right, uh, so that's, you know, Gerard up to Susquehanna, you know, Broad Street to the river, I mean, to the park. Within that 4.5 square mile area, uh, we've, uh, we've averaged close to 50 homicides and over 200 shootings just in that area. And, and so we can we know and, and you know the per capita numbers for the, the homicides occurring in that pocket are mirror those of Baltimore and Milwaukee, just in that four point. And so we also know, and it's sort of I think it's 77,000 inhabitants in that area. And so we know that those, so there's a there's no surprise when when the data overlays uh, in that concentrated area. And then going over into the east, going east from North Philly across our middle of our city, where that is our highest level. So we are seeing a correlation between the data that Dr. Blasco is uh, uh, coming out of her work and the correlation with our areas and in, in areas where we see a, a high concentration of violence uh, in the city. Uh, even when we look at uh, even when we look at the 
where our diversion, our diverted kids who will go from our diverted school diversion program, a large percentage of those kids will go back to uh, our program PAN, which is in North Philadelphia, even though they go to other zip codes and, and go to school in other zip codes. And, and so clearly, you know, then that's part of our work this year from the you know, my department is really focusing on those areas and, and where can we get the additional supports to be able to address this issue. Great, thank you. Excellent. And right, I'm gonna bundle our next couple of questions together. We're getting a lot of questions from folks about um, are there, you know, so everyone is saying, you know, young uh, gun violence begins at home or is in the community. Are there initiatives that you know of that meet, you know, young people or their families in their homes or in the community, provide service to them there? Does anyone want to speak to that? So on, in terms of Office of School Safety, we do have a um, program that focuses specifically on um, higher risk individuals, higher risk for um, gun violence victimization. Um, and that program, the Youth, Youth Violence Reduction Initiative does um, work directly with the families. Um, and so we're piloting that at one school with um, intentions of expanding the program. Thank you. Yeah, and, I, and I think, I mean, we, we, you know, if we even go back now 10 years with the school diversion program, and we, we saw that as a, a great opportunity to give those young people that we engaged and provide them in the service to our intensive preventive services. And there's seven, seven programs now uh, across the city, which continue to be almost a decade later where young people are able to go after school uh, and, and, and for services. Um, and even now here at the police department, you know, we are working with, you know, we have the curfew centers, but we also, uh, they have also become places where young people from seven to two o'clock in the morning have a safe place to go because they provide a plethora of services and activities for our young people. And so in addition to them being used as curfew centers, you know, Commissioner Ali and their team have also made them uh, uh, as beacons for young people to come uh, to, in, and I'm sure she'll be giving testimony on this tomorrow in, in her hearing for the budget. Uh, and so I, I think uh, there are a plethora of programs out uh, in the community. Uh, we just got to continue to make sure. I think the biggest thing, Maria, is making sure that we have system mapping, like people know where to go. Oftentimes you meet parents and we make these assumptions that they they know. And we have to stop doing that. We have to be more intentional about take your son or daughter here, do this here, uh, as my mother made me go uh, do things. And and because I think sometimes there's still this, still seem to be a gap on what is available and where you should be plugged in and 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 parents not knowing where, where, where to take their child. Yeah, that, that's absolutely a need and, and one that um, Stonely is hoping to address through uh, a project uh, managed by uh, one of our emerging leader fellows um, out of Temple University. Is that correct, Mark, out of Temple? Um, doing an assessment um, of community resources that are available for those affected by gun violence. So we're very happy to support that work. And um, if folks have other questions about that or um, preliminary findings around that work, please do reach out to us after the event. Absolutely, thanks, Marie. So next question comes from Napuni Gomez from the Drexel University School of Public Health. But he asks, what if any mental health services are available to children in Philadelphia public schools? So, uh, Yep, I'm sorry. As I shared earlier, uh, the school district's emergency crisis response team offers prevention and intervention, uh, grief counseling, emotional assistance, as well as they have two other um, uh, platforms. One is Cooth, a confidential online mental health and well-being platform designed to provide students with access to personal care at no cost to families, also available to high school students. And as far as uh, staff is concerned and employees, they utilize Lyra Health as employee-sponsored benefit. And it's also for emotional health care. All Thank schools you. have counseling services and things of that nature. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so the next question comes from Julia Zielinski. Julia asks, um, greatly appreciate the work that is being done to support and keep students safe through data and potential responses. I wonder um, what data is being collected around the perpetrators of shootings. Or is there any work during, being done towards prevention from that end? Wonder also whether shifting protocols based off of data. So for example, the Safe Corridors uh, program 
we'll just shift the time of the shooting to say 68, 6 to 8 p.m. or a different day of the week. What is being done to determine the causes of these shootings and meet the needs leading to them in the first place? And is that a concern for the program? Would Is there a concern that implementing the program will just shift the locations or timing of the shootings taking place? I'm going to suggest that we break that down. So the very first yeah. question was what? So what is being done to determine the causes of these shootings? What data is being collected on the, the perpetration of them? I think that's you, Brandy, obviously, right? Yes. So um, the other part, I know a lot of people are asking questions which seem to relate to the second part of my my project, which we will be presenting on as part of a webinar. I'm really still working some of that out in terms of how I want to model the data to um, to answer those questions. Um, and so, um, but we do, so I will be doing all of the research both on individuals who are victims and individuals who are perpetrators. So same data that I'm, I'm using for the victims. Great, thank you. Mark, was there more um, other parts of that question not answered by what uh, Brandy just said? Yeah, so I think there's an implied question of say, so implementing something like the, the Safe Passages program, you know, is there a concern that that would shift the shootings just to another location or time, or does it decrease the overall number of shootings that are taking place? Great question. It's, so, oh, go ahead, Greg. Sorry, no, I was gonna say, yeah, I was going to say we, we implemented a Safe Path program last year. And so it certainly is going to be evaluated. Um, Brandy is going to be taking a look at that as well. And, and we we hope that the answer is no. We will see it in the near future. Great. I can also say just findings from, so Chicago um, has the Safe Path Program. Um, and so I can say from the evaluations and studies that have been done on their program, um, not looking at shootings, but um, violent crimes in general, um, they did find that having the Safe Path did not shift um, that's always one of the concerns in, in crime research, um, that it'll just shift it to another location. So they did not find um, that that occurred. Excellent. Thank you. Next question comes from Paul DiLorenzo, who talks a little bit about working on violence, youth violence reduction programs, um, and seeing similar you know, data about gun violence incidents over the last two decades. Um, he says, we saw early results with our work. The issue is sustaining it over administrations that may decide they want to change or try other approaches. How can we ensure that the impressive efforts that you all are doing can be sustained? I'll speak for myself. I mean, I, I think that's why um, we kind of use a more of a smart policing data informed. I think that if, if you use it, my position, if, if you use the data and not, you know, not anecdotes, not, you know, just really focus on the data, uh, it can drive you, you know, it can drive through it or administrations, right? Because it does not, I mean, because it, it'll meet the metal time. If we do the strategy effectively, if we use it from a data informative, then we kind of create a barrier around ourselves that uh, you know, regardless of who comes in as the leader has to make a decision. I can see the success from the program because I see the data and the success of it. Uh, I'll go back to the diversion program as a great example of that, you know, 90% reduction over 10 years. Who's going to come in <laughs> and say, well, we're going to stop doing school diversion, right? I mean, they're not, right? Because it, because we've been able through the data to consistently show the, the, the deep impact it's had on children's lives and, and the recidivism and the work that Dr. Damian Goldstein did from a researcher was able to, to really inform that you know that work because you were there for a minute uh, mark um so so part of it is is really i i see that as as the way you move through that process i think when you build programs it's just built on you know just really not seeped in not i know it's not going to be a formal evaluation sometimes it's just but really just doing some kind of evaluative tool to demonstrate to those on the other side who's receiving it that it has value and so that's just my two cents there Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, there are several questions again about the, the relationship between truancy and gun violence. I know we've talked about it a little bit already. Already, if there's anything else that anyone wants to say about that relationship? Um, Dr. Walford, you, you made a really strong case when we talked about this previously that it's dangerous to draw a straight line between truancy and um, gun violence, but that line does not exist. You want to say more about that? 
Yeah, I mean, I think we, again, we know um, attendance is so important from decades of research and it's important at different points. So as I was pointing out, it's important to academic achievement in the earlier grades and the later grades. It's important to graduating on time. Graduating on time is important to not dropping out. So I think there these things are connected and associated, but there isn't necessarily a straight line. But I would definitely say, um, you know, for everybody hunkering down on attendance and reducing um, absenteeism should be a high priority across the city um, and will likely have an impact on this fact, this issue as well. So uh, correlation, not causation. Certainly, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Next question comes from Kyle Evans. Um, in what way or is the faith community partnering with the school district in supporting youth and helping to reduce gun violence? So our safe path program, we partner with our six community partners. I don't know if any of them are directly faith based partners, um, but there's always opportunities uh, for us to partner with any organization who's willing to 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 help out and assist us. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, next question comes from Sarah Morningstar at ASAP. Um, Dr. Blasco, I think this one's for you. Um, and you may not know the answer to it. Are there high risk days and times for youth active in school district of Philadelphia schools? Are those different from other kinds of schools? Um, this person says alternative schools as a comparison, or are they similar or do we not know? So I have not um, broken down the data by um, by sector in terms of high risk times and locations, but I did see that question in the chat earlier and I wrote it down because I think that's an interesting question. Excellent, okay. thank you. Continued. And again, to everybody, we'll share a copy of all these questions with the team after this event. All right, let's see. I think, um, Dr. Blasco, I think this one is for you as well, but you may have answered it already. Um, did specific ages or grades present as most at risk to either be victims or perpetrators of gun violence in your data? Yeah, so I think um, it's pretty consistent with what we know from criminological research that um, those high school age um, individuals are more likely to be um, victims of gun violence. Um, I mean, the data do range from age four to as victims to um, 22 um, in terms of active students. Um, but we, we really see that spike around 16, 17, 15 years old. Excellent. Was the question relevant to perpetrators or victims though? I thought it said perpetrators. Victims. Oh, victims, okay. Yeah, the question asks about both, if you want to talk about both, but it's up to you. Yeah, um, I mean, I will be looking at that. I have not looked at the perpetrator data yet. One of my concerns with the perpetrator data is we don't know for sure, you know, a lot. We don't have a huge sample of actual perpetrators, right? Um, but I will be looking at that, at those data. I just haven't yet. Of course. All right, next question comes from Sarah martinez Healthman of the Samuel S. Wells Fund. Just thanks so much for this presentation. Many of my peers in philanthropy are focused on identifying people who are involved in gun violence and surrounding them with uh, services, much like Chief Wolford was describing. My concern is that when we focus on individuals alone, we often take our eye off of the systems that create the ongoing conditions for violence. And then the solutions are often individually based rather than system and policy wide. Um, the question is simply, do you care to comment on this? Um, so I actually think that's really, really, really important, um, which is why I'm a huge proponent of multi-level modeling. So the purpose of that statistical approach allows us to see, um, you know, what those school level um, factors are that maybe we can address as a school community, what those community factors are, and it kind of controls for all those individual things at the same time, right? So we can kind of, it allows us to parcel out what those individual factors are, what those school factors are, and what those community factors are. Um, and so I think it's really important to consider all levels when we're looking at this. And if I could add, I mean, part of part of the vision of this work for me was was specifically that because we, we have these silo systems that don't talk to each other. And, and, and so, you know, if I'm sitting in a room and I got a child, no one will tell me anything about him or her. Um, and, and, and so 
we we have to the only way we're going to change these systems is we really got to get to that intersection point where we can see it and that's what i'm hoping you know that the work that dr blasco and and, and dr wolver is allowing to happen that the district gets us to that place so you can start to see what what are the systematic things that we what are the things we have to do because again a lot of our systems just because of hipaa FERPA and all other different levels you're sitting in the room and we're not talking about no one knows a complete child is sitting in front of us and and i think that's the starting point of, of you know how can i me and craig we, we get very frustrated when i get called about a child who has all of these disabilities and all of these issues and no one knows until we've done something you know now after he's been taken into custody or he's done something that has resulted in his arrest or even you know and then you're finding out all of these underlying issues so i think it's it's it's, it's yes it's the systems but it's also how are these systems talking to each other and how are we, because I think I understand in the past about people are fearful that you would do something negative to a child when you have this information, your bias may root, come to, to bear, but if the full sole focus is do right by that child, then at some point we're going to have to share that information to do right by that child. Um, I mean, and it's then, a different direction, Marie, but I just wanted to get that in there. No, no, I think, I think it's a good direction to go in and, um, just another sort of um, shout out to the work of a Stonely fellow, Shay Bilchik, who's working on uh, multi-systems involved youth, like folks have heard about dual system involved youth, juvenile justice and child welfare. He's doing um, groundbreaking work out of the Center for Juvenile Justice at Georgetown about young people who are involved in multiple systems. Um, not just the two that I mentioned before and how uh, systems might coordinate and collaborate to, you know, mitigate harm um, caused to those young people, either by those public systems or the ecosystems in which the young people live, including family and community systems. So just mentioning that that work is out there, you can find out more about it on Stonely's website. Thank you, Marie. So I think we have time for one more question, if I'm reading the clock correctly. And we'll go ahead and close out our event. So this last question, and again, all the questions we weren't able to get to, we'll share with the team after the fact. Um, last question comes from Juliana Berardi uh, from the Children's Hospital Philadelphia Center for Violence Prevention. Um, she asks, how has Dr. Blasco shared uh, or planned to share, if you have plans already in place, uh, research with the participants and community members who may have ideas about prevention and intervention, um, especially in those five zip codes bearing the brunt of the act of gun violence? Yeah, so um, I spent my first one many years in corrections before this, um, and my research was always person-centered in terms of the individuals who are incarcerated and including them in my research. And so I plan to do the same here. Um, so we have been talking about adding a piece to my fellowship, which actually is a qualitative piece um, in terms of um, interacting with individuals in the community and individuals who are um, victims of gun violence um, or youth who are victims of gun violence. So. Um, I didn't talk about that today, um, but that is part of the plan for the fellowship. And just want to underscore that that's that's um, one of the values that Stonely seeks to infuse in all of our fellowships, that we're not making um, communities and individuals um, subjects of research, that we're not being purely extractive of their experiences, that we're being inclusive um, whenever um, issues that they face are being um, studied and, and also just reminding folks that this is um, phase one of Brandy's presentation of her research. She's doing much more than we were able to talk about today and she'll be presenting on that in the future as well. Excellent, so that brings us to the end of our audience Q&A. We're gonna bring our executive director on just to share a few closing remarks before the end of the webinar. Um, introducing Ronnie Bloom. Thank you, Mark. Hi everyone, I'm Ronnie Bloom. I'm the executive director at the Stonely Foundation. And on behalf of our staff and our board of directors, I'd like to thank our outstanding panelists, Commissioner Kevin Bethel, Dr. Brandy Blasco, Chief Craig Johnson, and Dr. Tonya Walford for participating in this afternoon's very timely and very informative dialogue. You've each provided us with vital knowledge and perspective about how we can best support and protect Philadelphia school age students amidst the crisis of gun violence in our city. We know this is just a start uh, for this conversation. Clearly we could go on, I think for the rest of the afternoon and there was so much interest in having this panel. I, I don't remember exactly the number, but we had 
many hundreds of people signing up uh, to participate. And in particular, we're grateful and proud that Stonely is able to support Brandy's cutting edge research at the school district with the goal of influencing policy and practice and ultimately improving safety for our young people. We're honored to count the commissioner and Brandy among our community of Stonely Fellows, and we really appreciate the time that all of you have taken to join us today. And huge thanks, as always, to Stonely's Deputy Director, Marie Williams, for her excellent moderation, and to our Grants and Impact Analyst, Mark Howe, for facilitating the Q&A. Stonely's been working on violence prevention for over a decade, and we've significantly increased our focus on this issue during the last four years. We currently have eight fellows who are working on issues directly related to gun violence in the city. To learn more about their work, a little bit of which uh, Marie referenced, as well as Stonely's other grantees, please visit stonelyfoundation.org and sign up for our newsletter. And with that, I'd just like to thank everyone again uh, in our audience for joining us today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Take care. Thank you all. Thank you.